Hey everyone, and welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today we are joined by Yolan Romier. I hope I haven't butchered that. Uh, Yolan is an applied cryptographer delving into and mostly dwelling on cryptography, secure coding, and other fun things. He has previously spoken at Black Hat USA, B Slides LB, Crypto Village, NorthSec, GopherCon EU, and DEF CON. On top uh, on topics, what, including automation in crypto cryptography, public keys, vulnerabilities, elliptic curves, post quantum cryptography, functional encryption, open source security, distributed ran randomness, and many more. Um, he introduced the first practical fault attack against the EDDSA a signature scheme and orchestrated the full disclosure with the code of the curveball vulnerability. Uh, these days he's working on the distributed randomness projects, uh, namely DRAND, uh, studying paired-based cryptography, distributed key generation, and threshold systems. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over, over to Yolan, and off you go. So yeah, hello, I'm Yolan. Today we'll be talking about time-lock encryption based on DRAND. So I will start with some intro just to make sure everybody understands what DRAND is and uh, how that kind of works. And then we'll dig into how it, the time-lock part actually works. I love digression, so I'm going to start with one. I don't know if you know what randomness is, but according to the Cambridge Dictionary, um, randomness is simply the quality of being random. Yeah, that's right. So that's super useful. Uh, actually, I kind of prefer to see randomness as being the quality of being unpredictable and of lacking any patterns, uh, which also happens to be the way some other dictionaries are defining it, which is a better way to define it, I think. With the notion of randomness and lacking patterns and, you know, uh, being unpredictable, um, we can already guess it must be hard for a deterministic computer to, to do that, right? So um, getting randomness is usually hard because we are not using true random generators in our computer. So you have truly random uh, processes in the, in the physical world that we could be using to produce true random numbers or strings. Um, it's often not the case. So a computer will usually use, you know, jitter or uh, what you typed on your keyboard or mouse movement, and it will gather some entropy, and then it will start using a CPRNG, so a cryptographic pseudo-random generator to produce random numbers. And actually, we had a very interesting uh, talk about it in a previous session, I think. So I guess there is a recording somewhere uh, in case you want to check it. Um, and I like to say randomness has different kinds of flavors, like secret, public, verifiable, and distributed. And so we'll quickly see uh, what these are because it's kind of important for the next part of the, of the talk. So public randomness is basically just a value that is meant to be public. It's really exactly what it is. So if you're playing a lottery, and you can see on TV, you know, people like drawing random values in a big like bowl, drawing the balls with the numbers on it. And that's a way to throw a public random value. And public randomness is really just that. It's just meant to be public. It's a random value you draw to, and then you can publish it. Um, what we're more used to even maybe unknowingly is the secret randomness because that's what we use to produce secret keys, non-seas, initialization vectors. And our computers are actually doing that multiple times a day, like many times a day, because every time we establish a TLS connection with a website, what's happening behind the hood is basically that the um, browser will um, establish like ephemeral keys, it will create ephemeral keys using secret randomness and so on. And the thing with secret randomness is that it is meant to stay secret. If you leak the secret value that was used to produce a secret key, then you don't get any security. Uh, same goes with nonces or IVs and so on. So secret randomness is really meant to stay like secret. 
public randomness, which is public, is kind of cool. But actually, if I were, you know, today to just say, okay, let's run a lottery. Uh, here you buy tickets, and then suddenly, uh, I don't know, like it's it's Patrick, my a colleague in the Duran team who's winning the lottery, everybody in the room would be like, hey, Yolan, you cheated. Uh, Patrick is a good pal of you. You, you made him win. Um, if I don't get any way to prove my randomness was actually random, um, I would lack any way. I, I, I couldn't tell you, no, no, I, I didn't do anything. I got nothing up my sleeves, right? So um, that's where the notion of verifiable randomness comes in and it's quite interesting. So the idea behind verifiable randomness mostly makes sense when you want to draw public randomness, but you also want to achieve some kind of, you know, auditability so people can see you didn't cheat when you draw the public randomness. Um, these notions were, you know, useful, but they're even more interesting when we were talking about distributed randomness. Because when we are looking at blockchain uh, systems or at distributed systems, achieving consensus on a random value is difficult. Already achieving consensus on, you know, in general can be difficult. But if you want to achieve consensus in a, on a random value in a way that prevents any actor to bias or influence the final randomness, uh, you cannot just say, oh, we'll be using, I don't know, the XOR of some random values because then you have a last player attack or that kind of things. So in general, producing random values on a distributed system, especially on blockchains or for smart contracts and so on is difficult. When we're talking about distributed randomness, we're also usually uh, talking about decentralizing trust. So we don't want to be we don't want to have to trust any single party. So for example, we don't want to trust NIST to be providing us with proper random beacons because NIST is running a public randomness service, providing public randomness to anybody asking for it. But uh, do you really trust NIST? <laughs> Good question. Usually in the blockchain space, we don't. And in the cryptography space, we don't necessarily trust them neither, right? So, I mean, they've been doing weird things in the past with randomness, right? So distributed randomness is quite important. And um, that's how DRAN came to live, actually, uh, to life. So DRAN was uh, initially a project uh, from a university, EPFL, and then it was um, picked over by Protocol Lab and it was launched um, in 2019. So DRAN is meant to be basically just like DNS or NTP servers. It's a way to get public verifiable randomness easily without trusting anybody. And DRAN is just an open source software, okay? So it's a software that you need to run on multiple nodes that connect together to form a network. And then you can pull randomness from a DRAN network and you can verify that randomness and verify it was properly generated and if as long as you trust there is never a threshold amount of malicious parties on a DRAN network, you can trust the randomness produced by DRAN is actually random. Um, so DRAN has actually been tested, audited and deployed in practice. And it's been running since 2020. Uh, actually we're we've just passed the two years uh, milestone in August. Um, so DRAN is currently being run by the League of Entropy, which is made of 16 organization, organizations with 23 nodes. Um, we had zero disruption and zero downtime uh, for the past two years, so it's pretty good. It's, it has shown it's working as intended, you know. And we've produced over 2 million uh, random beacons so far. DRAN is a League of Entropy uh, mainnet is currently producing random beacons every 30 seconds. And uh, these are served over four uh, HTTP relays uh, provided by uh, Cloudflare and protocol labs, and also through uh, PubSub uh, if you want to use Gossip instead to get your randomness. Um, so now that we know there is a service providing distributed randomness, um, consistently for the past two years, we can move on to our timelock encryption scheme. So 
what is exactly time lock encryption? So time lock encryption is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's the being able to encrypt something that cannot be decrypted until a certain time has come. So for example, if I'm encrypting a message now and I don't want it to be decrypted until uh, Christmas, I could do it using a time lock encryption scheme if I have one. And it's also sometimes called time lapse encryption or timed release encryption. Uh, some people sometimes do um, a new saying, okay, there are like time lock puzzles or there are like timed release encryption because sometimes you can encrypt something that cannot be decrypted until at least a given amount of time has passed, but it doesn't mean it can be decrypted immediately once this minimum amount has passed. Uh, it can be like a minimal bound. It's not like the upper bound or stuff like that. So sometimes there are some nuance in the literature. Time lock encryption is quite interesting to do a lot of things. You can do uh, sealed bid auctions where every participant is encrypting their bids and the bids cannot be decrypted until um, the final you know, call for the auction comes. You could also do math prevention like uh, you're encrypting the transactions, and so you would you could have like have services that are ordering the transac transactions and some kind of services that are validating the transactions, and the two services doesn't necessarily need to be the same, and also the transaction could maybe be encrypted in some uh, part of the system. So time lock encryption has a lot of interesting uh, applications in the blockchain space. Also, like conditional transfer of wealth is really easy in the blockchain space. Like you could imagine you just encrypt your private key, like your private Bitcoin key, you encrypt it with a time lock encryption scheme. You say, we cannot decrypt it until, I don't know, one year in the future. And if you're still alive in one year, what you do is you transfer your funds to a new address. And so the secret key you, you time locked is useless and so nobody can get it. But if you happen to die or whatsoever, if something happened to you, uh, the people who got the cipher text could then decrypt it and recover your funds. Um, this has been already discussed quite a lot on the internet. Um, it could also help with electronic voting. And also quite interestingly, it's very useful to do um, like, I don't know, like disclosures or when you have a known embargo period on a document, like if it's legal documents or if it's, yeah, depending on the context, you might want to encrypt documents so that they cannot be decrypted until a certain time has come. But as soon as the time has come, you want them to be publicly available. And this is pretty cool because it means you can release documents that are encrypted upfront and you don't need to do anything in the future to enable people to access them. They could just take the cipher text and decrypt it as soon as the time has come. Um, so this means you can have non-interactive uh, embargo and documents. Another few fun possibilities with time lock encryption could be responsible ransomware. I really like the idea where, you know, instead of encrypting your files forever, the ransomware would be like, hey, Either you wait six months or you pay this amount upfront and you get your files today. Um, I think it would be like, um, you know, more honest ransomware work be nice. Uh, so if you're developing ransomware and you're, you know, as a hobby, please consider using time lock encryption. Um, also, there is a paper actually considering using it to escape emulation. Like, you know, um, you have a malware that is being analyzed by um, an antivirus. The antivirus is sometimes trying to sandbox it or to do emulation of the binary. Uh, so if the binary is containing a payload that cannot be decrypted until a certain time has come, uh, the binary could look like, you know, harmless when it gets emulated or analyzed. But suddenly at some point in the future, it could be able to decrypt its malicious payload and do nefarious things. So. Um, that was an interesting paper that came out a few years ago. To give you some insight into how oh, time lock encryption came to be a thing, we need to look into how oh, it came to life, right? So time lock encryption, the ID is actually fairly old. It's coming from Tim May in 1993. So you may know Tim May because he was actually uh, the father of the site, uh, of the crypto anarchist movement. And he published the time lock encryption ID on the cypherpunk mailing list. So uh, pretty cool stuff from, you know, almost 30 years ago. 
at the time, the main idea to solve time lock encryption was basically, hey, you just pick a notary and you, you know, convince them to naturalize the encryption keys until a certain time in the future, and then you trust them to not do it. And if they're behaving nicely as notaries should, um, you've got a time lock encryption system. That's not so cool because it means you have a trusted third party, right? So in 1996, uh, Rivers, Shamir and Wagner actually proposed another solution to achieve time lock, and their solution was actually a proof of work system. They introduced the notion of time lock puzzles, where you need to basically grind, do some like computation that takes a lot of time to do sequentially. Um, in that case, they were using a squaring, so you had to square a number, like modular squaring, so you had to square a number multiple times in a row until you achieve some value which would be your secret and you you can you know parallelize the computation so it should be ensuring anybody that you spent a minimum amount of time on that puzzle before you were able to solve it um, in that paper in 1996 it was quite interesting actually because uh, they said something which was um, basically, that there are only two natural approaches to implementing time release and cryptography. Either using time lock, so proof of work, or to use trusted agent like the notaries from uh, 1993 from Tim May's uh, initial email. And that's actually not how we do it, so we're pretty happy about it, right? Uh, in 1999, Ron Rivers actually created a time capsule that was meant to uh, to to you know, to keep 35 years to, re to break. Um, and that time capsule actually was broken only 20 years later. Uh, so in 2019, uh, two different teams broke it. So on one front uh, in April, there was a guy running it on his computer for like three and a half year and he was able to break it. So it just means the hardware got much faster than uh, Rivers expected it to become and um, like 10 times faster. So that's, you know, it's difficult to predict the future, right? And in May, a collaboration between Ethereum Foundation, Supranational, and Protocol Labs actually used the FPGA implementation, so hardware implementation, to solve it in only two months. So this is really, really fast. So it was something that was meant to, you know, take. 35 years to compute, and we were able to do it in two months in 2019. So um, proof of work based system are very sensitive to hardware advances and to hardware, you know, evolution in general. There are a lot of other proposals to achieve. You know, like some of them are based on Bitcoin proof of work uh, using the basically the Bitcoin network uh, as a um, as a cryptographic clock. Uh, some of them are using other IDs. And most interestingly here are, um, is the, um, the last one about how to build a time lock encryption, uh, because that one is introducing the notion of computational reference clock or cryptographic clock. And uh, it's also using identity-based encryption to achieve uh, time lock encryption. So this is actually very close to what we're doing here uh, today in our um, time lock encryption scheme based on DRAM. The problem with most of these pre or ARPs and most of the stuff I've just presented you is that either it's proof of work based, so it means you need to do a lot of computation and you're burning the planet, which is not so great. And also it's very sensitive to specialized hardware. So it's also not so great because it means if you want to produce a time lock puzzle that is both able to resist an attacker for 20 years, but also that anybody can compute in 20 years, um, you won't get there without providing these people with specialized ASICs, which is kind of painful. And then it would mean these people would need to run the ASICs for 20 years to be able to solve your uh, puzzle. Ah, not amazing. Um, some of the other proposals are using cutting edge cryptography, like they are, I don't know, assuming uh, obfuscation or they're, yeah, assuming some other stuff that is not so practical. And so we come to that impractical point. So obfuscation and amorphic crypto systems in general are very, 
are way too slow nowadays, right? So maybe we'll get there at some point in the future, but currently it's not very practical. And also all of them are not actually deployed in practice. I mean, there are some proof, proof of concepts using Bitcoin. And there is like another, like a paper from um, 20, nine that was saying they would be providing an open source implementation and also an op like an op a public service to be able to do uh, time lock encryption using that service but they never provided it so none of them are actually deployed so that's how we came to uh, look into implementing and providing a service that would be live and that's what we did actually so currently that's our goal, right? We are right now, and we need to be able to encrypt towards a future time. And here, I represented some cryptographic reference clock ticks, you know? And it's funny because that looks exactly what, like what Dirand is currently doing, right? Because Dirand is currently producing randomness on a given, uh, at a given frequency. So currently, it's every 30 seconds. And you can trust the DRAM network to not produce randomness too early because that is definitely not the goal of the network. So it would break the, the trust people have in the network. So the League of Entropy has no um, you know, advantage um, breaking that trust. And also it's pretty cool because you can predict which round will be at what time in the future. So you can say, okay, um, in five minutes, we'll, we'll have advanced exactly 10 rounds, stuff like that. Now, how can we achieve time lock encryption based on Dirand is a funny um, thing. The funny thing is Dirand is uh, based on BLS signatures, on the BLS signature scheme. So actually a Dirand beacon is, com is made of a um, signature, a BLS signature, and that BLS signature is then hashed to obtain the randomness. That's how we achieve verifiability of the randomness produced by the Duran, by the Duran network. And the really nice thing about BLS is that actually BLS signatures are related to identity-based encryption because in 2001, when Bonnet et al. produced their uh, identity-based encryption based on the whale pairing paper, they noted in that paper that actually you can also use pairings and something similar to identity-based encryption to do signatures. And two years later, they released the BLS scheme, which is exactly um, which is doing exactly that. What they noted in twenty uh, in uh, two thousand one was that basically, if you reveal the decryption key of your identity-based encryption scheme. It's equivalent to um, being a signature because you can verify it under the master secret key, uh, the master public key. Um, that means that currently Duran is releasing every 30 seconds an identity-based encryption key. Um, we can use that identity-based key to decrypt messages. The question is what kind of messages? And the answer is basically, whatever is getting signed by Diran. This is how it works. Don't worry, I'll actually try to break that down into simpler steps. So first we need to recall how yellow signatures work. So we have a public key P, which is basically just a secret S time a generator G1, which is on the group G1 because yellow signatures are based on pairing. So we have two groups, G1 and G2. And um, here S is basically just an integer, you know, and P is a public key. It's basically like ECDSA or EDDSA. It's just like, it looks like LAP curve uh, standard of signature schemes, except we will be using the pairings to do the verification later on. So Durand is actually hashing the epoch it wants to sign and is just signing it. So a uh, Durand signature is basically the secret time the hash of the period. And there is one trick. So it's that Durand is actually using a threshold um, BLS uh, 
like setup. So it means every node is producing a partial signature, which is here represented as PI, which is equal to SI, the signature of a node. And it's just every node is going to be signing the same message. So we have uh, the hash of the epoch, which is a message. And um, the signature with BLS, the BLS uh, scheme we're using here is actually on G2. You can do signatures with BLS either by having the public key on G1 and the signature on G2, or you can do it the other way around with the signature on G1 and the public key on G2. But here we do um, public key on G1, signatures on G2. GRAN is then aggregating all of the signatures together to get the final signature. But actually, the final signature is still a BLS signature. So it will be basically S, the secret of the whole network, um, times the message. So the message here, it was the hash of the epoch. To do time lock, what we'll do is basically we want to be able to map from uh, the DRAN signatures to the ID encryption scheme. And so to do that, we need to take QID. Yeah, we need to take QID being the, um, the hash of the epoch. So the identity we're encrypting towards is basically the hash of the epoch. The nice thing about, about pairing, right, is our bilinear. So what it means is here that if we have the pairing of G1 with a sig, oh, sorry. We have the pairing of G1 with P, a signature of a message M. The pairing of G1 with P is actually equal to the secret S times the pairing of G1 and the message. And this maps naturally to the public key um, uh, because if we take the pairing of the public key and the message M, we will get that the bilinearity means both are equal. So that's how BLS signature work. They verify basically that your, the pairing of your signature together with the generator will be equal to the pairing of the public key together with the message you're claiming to have signed. And it, that's the gist of the idea, right? But that is really nice because it also looks a lot like a key agreement. So it means you, we can agree on some common key easily. The problem being anybody can easily compute the uh, pairing of the public key together with a message and get your <laughs> a shared secret. So you cannot use that directly to obtain a shared secret. You need some extra steps. And um, to ensure secrecy, we will need to add the notion of ephemeral key to the mix. So we will have a random value R. We will compute its ephemeral uh, public key, PE. And now we can compute R times the pairing of the public key together with the message. And that is going to be equal to R times the secret of the group, which we don't know, right? Uh, times the pairing of G1 and M. And when we get the signatures, if we know the ephemeral public key PE and the signature, we can compute the pairing of PE together with the signature, which is the pairing of R times G1 and S times M. And so that is by bilinearity, it's equal to R times S times the pairing of G1 and M. So that's exactly a key agreement, basically. We have two different ways on agreeing on a common reference string on a, on a common key. And that is how we do time lock here. So um, we compute GID as being the pairing of the public key of the group together with the hash of the oak. Uh, which can be pre-computed because it will be the same for everyone. Then we choose a random mask, uh, sigma. We set the nonce or whatever you want to call it, the ephemeral secret key maybe. We set the ephemeral secret key to R being the hash uh, of, the, of the mask together with the message, just so it's you know, unique. Um, and then we output the ciphertext U being the ephemeral public key R times G1. Uh, v, which is basically just a commitment to the mask uh, sigma uh, that you've uh, got earlier. And then W, which is the message uh, exhort with the hash of sigma. So this is basically a one-time part of the message you want to encrypt. 
And this is actually coming from the IB paper from Bonnet all from 2001. So that's a nice thing here. It's that we've been able to map directly to the paper, not using anything new, not changing the scheme whatsoever. So we can directly benefit from the security analysis from that paper. So we get CCA uh, security. And then to do decryption, uh, as soon as you get a signature for that epoch, so if you get P of rho, you can compute the hash of the pairing of U. So U was the ephemeral public key. Uh, and U and the pairing of U with the signature will give you R time S time E. You hash it, you hash, you, you XOR it with V, you get your uh, mask sigma, you can hash the mask, you can hash the mask sigma to get your one time key, you hash it with W, you get the message, and you can verify the commitment, you can verify everything was computed correctly by computing the value R out of sigma and the message, and you can verify the ephemeral public key was actually produced by R, uh, and then you get the decrypted cipher text. So it's really easy to do. And it is also directly based on the ID paper. So the initial ID didn't change here. Um, so we are working on a preprint about the details behind using DRAND uh, as a time lock encryption scheme or ser service, rather, time lock encryption service. Uh, there is a link here to access a public Notion site about how we do it with all the math and a few um, details about future work. So I'll be releasing the slides uh, on my website, and I guess we can link them on Twitter or yeah, and we can also link them somewhere, I don't know. So um, it should be fairly easy to get the slides on the link if you want to, um, because that's yeah quite difficult to copy, I guess. We had a few problems, though, to do time lock encryption using DRAN because DRAN was using chain randomness. So each message was linked to the previous one because it was the hash of the round concatenated with the previous signature, which means that nobody is able to predict the next message before, like the round just before it. Um, but actually, from a security point of view, if you've been able to compromise a threshold number of nodes and you got the secret key of the group, then you can regenerate all past messages and it doesn't change anything. So you could get all the past signatures you would need. So it's not actually bringing much in terms of security. And also it's making the verification of randomness more complicated because you need to know the signature of the previous message in order to verify the current round. So it was a bit painful and we could solve it easily by introducing unchained randomness, uh, which we brought to the network in uh, February, 2022. So unchained randomness is currently running on testnet uh, on DRAN. And unchained randomness is basically just we are signing the hash of the round number. So anybody can predict a future round number. And that means we can use the, these hashes as the identity we're encrypting towards uh, using the IB scheme I just presented. So it means also its verification is much simpler because under our security, you know, our trust assumption, if you trust there is never a threshold amount of malicious parties. You can trust that anything signed by the public key of the group um, is valid. And so you can just verify the signatures using the public key of the group. There is one thing though, uh, you may have noticed I was using a one-time pad between M and the hash of Sigma. So depending on our hash function, or if we are using maybe an extended output function, we could encrypt more or less data. Uh, but most extended output functions are limited in terms of you know the uh, size of their um, your maximum size of the digest and stuff like that. So how do we encrypt a 10 giga file? Uh, we decided we would just be using hybrid encryption like everybody does, like PGP does, like uh, a lot of people do. So what we do is we encrypt with AES the data, and then we just encrypt using time lock, the AES key we use to encrypt the actual data and no need to worry about extended output functions whatsoever. We can just use uh, SHA-256 or whatever, Blake, and 
that is enough to encrypt 10 gigabyte files because the actual encryption is done with um, AES or Shasha. Actually, in our case, we are using uh, Shasha 20 uh, poly thir uh, 1305. So, so it's um, authenticated encryption scheme and we, it's fairly fast. So we didn't really need to care about, you know, mode of operation whatsoever. Also, it's got a good RFC, it's well defined. So that's it, basically. We, just, we, we had this proof of concept with the math and everything working since November or even December last year. And then we decided we really needed to move on. And so we worked uh, together with uh, Arden Lab to produce a Go library, uh, which is called TLUC. Uh, and then we worked together with Patrick uh, to produce a JavaScript, well, actually TypeScript library, uh, which is called tluck-js. Um, both are currently defaulting to using the test nets because the League of Entropy test net is the only network running Unchained Randomness right now. We are planning to release uh, Unchained Randomness on mainnet very soon. It should have been done um, in two weeks, roughly. It will probably be postponed maybe a week or two, but it's getting very, very, very soon. So if you want to try it out, you can already try it out using testnets because testnet has uh, 13 nodes running. So you don't need to trust any single party. You just trust that the threshold network uh, running testnet is not compromised. The threshold is only six on uh, testnet currently. And when it will land on mainnet, we will have a threshold of at least 13, maybe more. And um, we have four, 24 nodes currently running on mainnet, uh, maybe more in, in a few um, months, but currently um, that's the um, threshold we have on mainnet. So we also have a CLI tool, which allow you to test it in the uh, terminal super easily, uh, encrypting and decrypting with uh, testnet or you can specify your own network using flags if you want, uh, or if you're running your own uh, unchained network at home, because anybody can run a different network. So anybody could launch their own uh, time lock encryption service using DRUN as well. It's just the nice thing about the League of Entropy is it's a kind of, you know, it's an old network running to produce distributed randomness meant to do a lot of other things which is kind of unrelated to time lock encryption. And it's really nice to be able to use the legal entropy also as a time lock service. So uh, I would say it's an argument to not launch another network, but yeah, if you want to, you could do it locally as well. Um, so that's the CLI tool. The inspiration behind the CLI tool is actually based on AGE, uh, which is an opinionated um, encryption CLI tool made by Filippo, uh, which you might know in the cryptographic community. Um, and then we also decided it was not enough to just have a CLI tool, but it would be much you know, nicer to have a um, web demo. And so we created a Time Vault web demo where you can just go on your browser and it will be using the TLUC.js to do the encryption and decryption locally on your device. And so let me try it live, you know, to do a demo. So here we have the Time Vault uh, website. We can choose a time in the future, let's say 45. We can say hello, PL. We get a AG encrypted file because um, we are using AG behind the hood um, to do the um, hybrid encryption. So we didn't have to re-implement the wall hybrid encryption. Anyway, so if I paste it here now, it will say, hey, you cannot decrypt it yet because it's not yet 45, right? And um, I could also uh, try to do it um, in the terminal, I guess, piping it into CLE and say decrypt. And I guess, oh, did I forget? Oops. And now it worked because the time has lapsed. So if I try again in the browser, it should also work. Hello, PL. So as you can see, and this is currently running on testnet, but still, uh, it's still a threshold network. It's still difficult to compromise, hopefully. Um, and so it's working. If you want to try it, or if you want to you know, do something with it, you can start working on the development today. 
and you could be using the uh, main net uh, when we launch it in a few weeks. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. There are a couple issues, I guess, when dealing with the future. So obviously new attacks. Uh, so we are relying on the IB scheme from 2001 and we're relying on BLS, both um, if the same security assumptions. So if somebody is breaking BLS or pairing base cryptography, um, then our, our time lock encryption scheme couldn't protect your data for the next, you know, five years or whatsoever. Also, quantum computers are obviously a threat because uh, none of the schemes we're using here except for the hybrid encryption scheme. So the time lock part is not resistant to quantum computers. Uh, currently, it's quite difficult to imagine doing a quantum resistant time lock scheme using the same ID because we don't really have the um, you know, the nice uh, properties we get with pairings uh, with quantum scheme right now. And there are also not too many um, threshold crypto system that are quantum resistant. So if we want to not have a single trusted party and we want to decentralize the trust like we do here using a threshold network, um, using quantum, com assuming quantum computers, uh, it could be, you know, difficult. Also, more computing power. I mean, that's naturally a threat for our scheme because Shasha is supposedly like achieving at least a 128 bits of security. I think it's even way more. It could be like 256 bits Shasha. And um, the BLS scheme we're using, it's um, so the BLS uh, implementation we are using is based on BLS 12, 381. So because you know, pairings need pairing friendly curves. So that elliptic curve is currently believed to have the security of roughly 117 bits according to the latest attacks and estimates. So, I mean, as soon as we got more than 100 bits of security, we're practically safe for now. It could change in the future because attacks always get better, right? Don't forget it's a threshold network. so. It's fairly decentralized. It's fairly less resistant because we could do a resharing using the DKG, so the distributed key generation, as long as we have a threshold number of nodes available. But who can tell if the network is still going to be running in 10 years, in 20 years? We certainly hope so, but that's a very long uh, time, right? We can't really predict what's going to happen in the next 10 years. So we. I wouldn't say the this time lock encryption scheme is very useful to encrypt something for a long time in the future, but it's very useful to do a sealed bid auction. It's very useful to do meth prevention. Anything that is like a few seconds, minutes, hours, days in the future is fairly um, you know, safe. Also, there is a the problem of governance with a threshold network. So what if the League of Entropy members decide to stop the network suddenly? Um, so currently, it has not really been decided by the League of Entropy. And that's something we've been working on, producing a governance model and pub um, publishing it. Um, the question would be, is the League going to release all the keys, all the secret shares if it stops, or is it going to burn them and destroy the the group secret key definitely um, because that changes right the outcome if you encrypt something for i don't know into in five years and in three years the network says okay we stop the lean here are all the secret shares then anybody could decrypt your uh cipher text in three years as soon as the secret shares got released instead of waiting five years that could be an issue depending on what you encrypted you know so we need yeah proper governance model to ensure to, so that user can choose and i guess maybe we would need two networks right so one network that if it gets stopped uh shares would get released so people could choose to use that one so there are shares or um secret is never lost it could be decrypted too early but it won't be lost and another network where the governance is basically we delete the share if ever we decide to stop the network. And so whatever you encrypt with the network cannot be decrypted until the time has come for sure. Or it could maybe never get decrypted if the network stopped before. But these are difficult questions you need to ask yourselves when you're playing with thresholds um, 
uh, sort of services threshold uh, networks. And uh, yeah, most credits go to the rest of the team actually. So the initial ID and the first proof of concept around the time lock encryption scheme was actually produced by Nicola Gai. Um, then Patrick, my colleague, is behind all the JavaScript and TypeScript magic. Most of it, I, you know, only played with the crypto, um, the few, um, the few crypto lines. And then we got the design of the web demo by Julia Armbrust, uh, um, which is also a protocol lab um, colleague. And then also we want to thank a few people, such as Justin Drake, Jason Donenfeld, and also Adam Lab, because um, they were very useful during the whole uh, thing. So. We had comments about the scheme, some future work ideas. Also, uh, with Jason, we had the pretty cool idea that we could be using time lock encryption to do responsible disclosure. You know, when people go on Twitter and post the hash of their findings, well, what they could do instead is post the link to a paste bin containing the time locked ciphertext. And even if they get hit by a bus, um, in the meantime, anybody could decrypt. Uh, their findings in 90 days or 120 days, whatever the responsible disclosure uh, deadline they chose to use uh, as lapsed. So that's a pretty cool, um, that's a pretty cool um, application, I think. And that's the one we presented actually at DEF CON um, last month in August. And that's it basically. So if you're watching these and you're like, oh, this is a pretty cool project, I would love to help run a, a threshold uh, service providing time lock encryption and also distributed public randomness. Well, the legal philanthropy is actually hiring new members, especially if you're um, in Asia or in geographies where we don't have too many people, because the goal of a threshold network is to be decentralized and also to never have a threshold amount of people, I don't know, running on AWS or running on, uh, on uh, G Cloud or whatsoever. So yeah. The league is trying to get more people to join and be more secure and more distributed. So yeah, don't hesitate to go on the website, run that lab if you're interested. Awesome. Well, thank you, Yola. That was very interesting. Really interesting.